Now the policeman said to me, does your dog you know, normally do this? I said, never. And then all of a sudden, the penny dropped. It's dusk, the dog's barking like this. He's trying to warn us all, it's coming. Seeing is believing, and I have no proof of what I saw that day other than what I can describe. It was huge. It was like the weightlifter of cats. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hi everyone and welcome to Big Cat Conversations coming to you in November 2020. We're going to hear about two cases in the south of England in Wiltshire and Berkshire and a case in Gloucestershire. So our first guest from Berkshire is Tim. Tim, welcome to the show. Hi Rick, how are you doing? Yes, great. Looking forward to chatting, Tim. And we're going to hear an old report and a new report. And it's going to be very interesting to hear you compare them and compare the animal and compare the the emotional reaction. So, Tim, can we hear, first of all, about the sighting in Wiltshire on the military training area, I think? And was it 2004, 2005, you were saying? 2004. Okay, yeah. Can we hear all about it? What you saw, what the situation was and what happened? Well, at the time, I was uh, contracting and doing some electrical work out on the Salisbury Ranges. And I was literally driving backwards and forwards every day. And one day I had to stop to let a vehicle go the other way and looked along a line of trees. There was a gap, like a fire break between rows of trees. And I looked up there and some probably three, 350 feet up there was a large cat. And I was just absolutely stunned couldn't believe couldn't believe my eyes is is probably the best way to say it <laughs> i mean it was like it was daytime the, the cat was dark i wouldn't say black but dark and i would say leopard shaped i think that's probably the best way to say it mm-hmm. we've all seen them in the zoos etc and then of course i looked it up but it was definitely quite i wouldn't say chunky but a roundish animal but definitely cat, you can see by the way it was walking, because obviously at that time I was stationary. Then I had to drive on because it's seriously you're not allowed to hang around, <laughs> um, wandering around the, the area, and um, never thought anything more about it. Did my work and returned back to the main offices later on in the afternoon. And as was the way, talking to the guys who worked there, literally said to them um, while we were having a cup of tea, oh, you never guess what I saw today. And they went, oh, go on, what did you see? And I said, I saw a large cat. And they went, is that it? We've all seen it. <laughs> and my breath was taken away. It was so matter of fact. It, apparently it's seen really regularly. And I've, I've never thought about it anymore to this day. But, yeah, it, it was so matter of fact that everybody sees it. Um, and if you think about it, apart from occasionally with a few people running around and making a lot of noise, it's a pretty quiet area. Yes, I always think if we're talking about the expanses of Salisbury Plain, that it's quite close to savannah type terrain, isn't it? It would pass as parts of the African savannah, I would say. Yes, it has some very high vegetation and some woods and things. I wouldn't say forest, but woods of quite some size, but it also has long grasses. And the wildlife in there, as in pheasants, deer, there's a huge amount of deer, as you can Mm. imagine. Obviously, foxes, badgers, everything else you can imagine. Perfect for an animal of that type. I obviously don't know whether it was a male or a female or whether it was passing through or whatever, but um, apparently it's been reported... I mean, not just over months, but over years. Okay. Of course, there might be more than one. And how did you judge the scale, Tim? Where it was going to was pine trees. And it is a almost like, you know how they sometimes plant pine trees for the wood and they're regularly set? And that's how you can tell the scale of the animal against the, the, the size of the trees. And presumably at the distance you were from it, it would have been very small and hardly noticeable if it was a domestic size cat, feral domestic size cat. Definitely not a domestic size cat. Oh, absolutely not. Not 
I'm convinced, absolutely convinced, it was a large cat. It was in the grass between the trees, between the rows of trees. I wouldn't say the grass there was particularly long, if not mown, but perhaps a, a domestic cat would have been hidden. Yeah, did you get a view of the tail at all, or any other distinguishing no, features? No, okay. No, I didn't. I have to say, I think probably like everybody else, the first time you see one of these, you actually, you actually are so astonished, you forget everything. What time of day it is, where you're going, what you're going to do. It's just, oh my God, look at that. <laughs> sure. Did you notice anything about its behaviour? Was it sort of low to the ground or walking or predatory mode? It was actually stationary. I think it had detected my presence, Ah, uh, but it was actually stationary. It only walked a couple of paces. It wasn't going anywhere. It wasn't frightened by me. didn't appear to be, although he was taking notice of me. So you went back and did a bit of investigating, uh, presumably in textbooks rather than the web at that that time, did you? And, and The web was about, but not that good. But yeah, you just kind of get a couple of books from the library and have a look and see what it was. To my way of thinking, and remember, it wasn't a huge amount of time that I looked at it for. It looked to be sort of leopard shape. That was my impression. Okay. You reached a personal conclusion it was a black melanistic leopard, presumably then at that time. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And interesting that you're saying it wasn't particularly jet black, slightly orange hue or browny hue to it. Browny hue, I would say. Yeah. So we can move on now to summer just gone 2020, can't we, I think, and compare it. And tell us what happened out the kitchen window, yeah? Well, I consider myself to be very lucky because I'd now seen two large cats. Mm. I was literally sitting at the breakfast bar, which faces out of the rear windows of the house. Now, I must explain that my house is in the middle of fields. It's an old farm type cottage, and we have no visible houses around us. So I just look out into fields. And I was sitting having breakfast, and a movement caught my eye, and I looked, and I looked across the field from us at the bottom of the garden across that field. And there was a movement. And I thought, oh, my God, look at the size of that dog. It's a black lab. Somebody near us has got a black Labrador. And I thought, look at that black lab. And then I thought, looked again and thought, that's not a Labrador. That's a cat. You can see by the way it's moving. You know how cats, when they're sauntering along, their shoulders almost appear to be hunched and the body hangs down between them mm -hmm. they walk as if they haven't got any cares in the world they're just absolutely calm and at ease and strangely on the other side of the hedge where the cat was is a road and cars were going past and he was taking no notice whatsoever he was just just quietly minding his own business and meandering along now i would have questioned myself seeing that over the edge of the bottom of my garden, or field and garden. Mm -hmm. But my wife happened to be there, and I called to her to show her, and she couldn't see it because at that moment it had gone behind a tree. Mm -hmm. And then when he came out the other side, she said the same thing. Oh, my God, it's a cat. She said, where's the binoculars? So we went and got the binoculars and looked again and traced it right along the edge of the field for quite some way till we couldn't see it anymore. We both agreed that it was a black cat, Absolutely jet black. Yeah. And wasn't in the slightest bit perturbed by where it was or its surroundings at all. Not at all. Yes. Confident may have done that route before. That's what I think. Yes. Yes. How close to your house initially, do you think? Maybe about 170 yards. Because the field curves around. What I thought was the far side of the field actually is about a third of the way nearer to us because it curves around in that corner. Yeah. It's very interesting if I might just diverge very slightly, is that what happened was I then phoned the police because obviously it's something that needs to be reported, which is how I got in touch with you. Mm -hmm. I phoned and reported it. The police turned up, though, as um, they pointed out themselves, is that if two policemen in a patrol car with tasers or whatever, <laughs> how the hell are they going to stop a cat? <laughs> but there we go. <laughs> if they find it, I think they were probably hoping they wouldn't find it. Yeah. 
But I then spoke to another policeman who had been doing a night patrol over on the um, fields the other side of the road at the bottom there, and he'd seen it as well some months before. Yes. Didn't he see a different one, though? He saw a Lynx-type one, didn't he? He saw a Lynx-type one, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I have also talked to one of the people that we know has said that there is amongst people who live around this area mm-hmm. – but it's quite a common sighting, more common than you think. It's like one of those things that people talk about, but everybody else has always seen it. Whereas, you know, had Susie, my wife, not seen it, had she not seen it, I think I would have been doubting myself because it was so close. For me, it was close enough. Yeah, yeah. And how much better view did you get through the binoculars? Did it become really clear and you were able to see tail and head well? Because that would be good to hear about. Yeah, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, from the close-up view, it seemed to have rounded ears rather than pointy ears. Yeah. Whether that makes a difference or not, I don't know. Uh, Most of our listeners will know that's a big tick in the box for something like a black leopard, if it was a black leopard, a melanistic leopard. And yes, it had a tail, but that's all I can say. Quite long. Yeah, okay. Length and thickness of the tail is always interesting to hear about. Quite long thickness, I couldn't. I would be guessing if I said, again, I was reasonably surprised. (laughs) It was larger than an average size Labrador, which is why I started questioning myself when I said, what's the black Labrador doing down there? Because I thought, if it's that far away, it's too big to be a Labrador that far away. And of course, the way it was walking, because dogs, as you know, they walk. Cats, how can I put it, slink, if that's a term. And that was the the thing that really, really made me look at it and think, yeah, that, that, that's not a dog. So I would say probably 25% larger than an average Labrador. In length? Yeah. In length, yes. So way, way bigger than a domestic size cat, domestic feral cat. Absolutely, yeah. And I have to say all the cats around here are a mixture of colours. There aren't any pure black ones. They're all feral and they live in the uh, stables and things. Yes, okay. Now, when you looked at it through the binoculars, did you notice any texture to the fur or did it just seem jet black? It just seemed to be jet black. And we are talking about half past eight in the morning with the sun up. So it was lit well and it appeared to be just jet black. Yeah, and I mean, the great thing is that, well, tell us, you know, I've been to visit you and and thank you for hosting me and accepting a couple of cameras. You know, tell us about the cameras. Yeah, we put a couple of cameras up. We put one on the far side of the field that would be the route for that cat. Mm -hmm. Nothing so far. And we've put one on the opposite side on a bridge um, over the motorway, which is a pinch point, as you know, as you you said. Mm. And we've we've had some good quality photographs but mostly of pheasants and uh, hares, because we get a lot of hares around here, mostly of pheasants, hares, fox, a lot of deer, an absolutely gorgeous photograph of a mouse, <laughs> which posed for the camera. And, uh, and so, yes, I, that, and that was in, what, six and a half days? Yeah, this is only the first check, isn't it? So there's, there's plenty of time. It was the first check and the first lineup. So I've now changed the um, the card and I'm going to leave it in there for three to four weeks before I go back. And obviously I'll be in touch with you to let you know how it's going. I've never done anything like this before. So it is actually very, very interesting. I think it's great that you live nearby these cameras. So easy for you to check and oh, yeah. or easy for you to monitor the cameras. They are both, I think, great positions because the first one that you said is the field side, exactly where you saw the cat walking. So if it goes there again and the camera's behaving, we might get it. And the other one is, well, not far away. And it's about the only route over a major trunk road. And so many mammals are going to be using that because it is just the funnel for getting that way, heading south, basically. Yeah, anything that wants to go over has to has to go that way. Yeah, that is the perfect pinch point that we all sort of want. Trunk road underpass or a trunk road bridge. That Absolutely. And on the other side, which you, you didn't go very far, you didn't have time, unfortunately. But on the other side, there are no humans for miles and miles and miles. So it's a good area where animals can feel safe. Sure. Have you seen any deer crossing the bridge yet um, on the camera? Oh, yes. 
Yes, yes. Well, that's a good sign. That is a good sign. Roe deer, fallow deer, and monk jacks. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing that I noticed about your area was that there were quite a lot of old, um, in the neighbouring fields, old sort of buildings that weren't... um, Not being used. Exactly. And a big mammal like a cat would shelter in some of those buildings. Uh, No problem. They're not going to be disturbed and they're going to be full of uh, rodents and rabbits around the edges. It's great. Undisturbed cover, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have actually warned the farm to approach those with caution. Fine. I think that's the right thing to do. When I always meet a new landowner and they've got old moribund buildings or old caravans that have got a window off or something, mm. I always say, well, if you're going to meet it anywhere, this will be where, so be, be careful. We've had farmers back out of barns before and twice heard of people seeing one sort of sleeping, resting up in an old um, semi-derelict caravan, which they will do. If there's no human disturbance, human smell there, they might well do that. But how long after a human habitation does the, the smell of us last? I mean, does, is it, is, does it disappear in a couple of weeks? or? I don't know, but I actually think... Does it matter? How much does it matter if the human smell is around? Well, I expect at a motorway edge or a trunk road edge, not a great deal because there's going to be plenty of human smell around there from litter and um, uh, whatever Mm. anyway, even though there's no houses around there. I don't know is the answer, and I'll try and look that up and find out if anybody does know. But That's a very valid point because both cameras are are near roads. Mm. Albeit that the animals wouldn't be exposed to the road at all, they'd be absolutely hidden. Yeah. But it does mean that the human um, scent is in that area. So they're not necessarily going to know that I've been marching around the fields uh, putting cameras on. Yeah. I I mean, I still feel it's a good discipline and you're better off minimising the trips to the cameras and minimising the disturbance. But I think in the place of deep rural countryside, away from human activity, a cat is probably more sensitive to human smell than one near the edge of a town Mm. or near the edge of a road. I just think it's about what they're used to. So Mm -hmm. maybe put some catnip or lure near the camera anyway because that all helps and it may be more of a tractant than the factor of your smell being there it might override you know it's got something that's luring it it doesn't matter about the human smell i did put the catnip down mm. a good handful as you said yeah and i can honestly say that um the fox in particular had spent a long time there sniffing at the at that area so okay that yeah. was that was interesting to see. Yes. Have they started scenting that, that area? Because that's, again, good. Because then, then it's, it becomes its own little lure because they all stop and scent. And if that can happen, that'd be good. Rick, I have to put my hand up and say, I cross that bridge when I take my own dog for a walk. And he's done it for us. <laughs> good for him. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he gets a cut if we get the money shot then. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you feel about having a cat so close to a big panther, a black leopard perhaps, so close to your house? And how does your wife feel? There is no doubt in my mind in this country that we have probably quite a few large cats that we generally don't know about. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the amount of cats versus the population, you know, how many people have been injured by a large cat? That would be none then. Um, Or a negligible amount negligible amount we can't say that yeah um therefore it doesn't worry me in the slightest quite the opposite i'd now sit and have breakfast every morning hoping to see you know really do i mean i would love to see one and, and, and this time instead of grabbing the binoculars i'll grab my wife's um, um nikon camera and, <laughs> and have a good, a good snap at it yes i think you managed to get a decent half decent photograph it's a good camera so yes we'd get a very high resolution Okay, so do you regret not doing that last time because you went for the binoculars? Would I have loved to have sat in front of you and said, look at that print? Yeah. To be very honest, yes. Like I said earlier on, we were just both so absolutely blown away by it that we just didn't think. That's common, as you know. A lot of podcast listeners are very frustrated with witnesses, but they haven't been witnesses in that situation. So you don't know until it occurs. Well, that's good. We've got two options, you know, you from the kitchen table and the trail camera as well, if it's doing its job. Yeah. 
when we first chatted before you came on, we were talking about being careful about the location and who you tell and not wanting to disturb the area. And you were relating it to places that you feel are pretty special when you go diving because you're a diver. And can you tell us about the seahorses comparison you made? Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I was very lucky that off the British Isle Coast, I was taken and shown underwater some seahorses. These are repopulating after many, many years of not being there. And we had to keep it an absolute secret, not telling anybody, not even other professional divers, for the fear that the word would get around and the habitat be destroyed by people coming and tramping all over it. I'm quite a high-level dive instructor. Mm-hmm. So I am very particular about underwater conservation. Not everybody is, and not everybody has the control over their diving, i.e. buoyancy, to make sure that they don't kick up the bottom all the time when they're thinning along. I've seen it and had to correct it many times. So the last thing we want is people coming and destroying the habitat that these seahorses would be in. And the same goes for the cats. The last thing we want is for hundreds of people to be tramping over the area, putting the scent down uh, and frightening the cats away, and we never see them again, which is effectively what would happen. I know probably other people would have other points of view, but you know we want to treasure these. Isn't it wonderful that we've got this wildlife where so much of the world is being destroyed and stripped of its natural inhabitants? Um, that we've actually got somewhere that we're they're naturally inhabiting. Yes, we've done it randomly by accident. Yeah. If you're regular to the podcast, Tim, you've heard me ask plenty of people this, but I have to pose it to you. What if it took your dog? Do you think there could be downsides to having these large carnivores around? And because we've got to think about that as well. Of course there is. Of course there is, because you know, you've also got to think of farms and farmers. We're not only talking about the breeding of cows and sheep and pigs Mm. if the cats make themselves a nuisance then okay something has got to be done about it but humanely i mean Mm. could we humanely trap could we track the cat and, and capture it rather than kill it and one would like to think that if farmers gamekeepers farm managers were having a problem that they'd make a noise about it so that we would know and possibly be able to do something about it. And that would support them getting assistance rather than them suffering in silence. Yeah, absolutely. As you know, I live on the edge of an estate, and I have been talking to the estate people, and not one of them has had a negative reaction. Yeah, it's very decent of them, I have to say, and they've, they've been very positive about putting the cameras up and wanting to keep in touch. Absolutely. Of course, we had to have permission. But it wasn't just permission. It was like, oh, yes, and let us see the results, you know. Which is wonderful, because you're acting as a broker with the landowner. So there's a trust there. And we can only do this educational work, really, with the, the benefit and the agreement of the landowner. So good for them. It's the only way we'll learn more about these animals eventually. Their habits are somewhat similar to the would be in their natural environment. But they've also adapted, so they've adapted to our country and eating habits, etc. must be different. Well, you say that, but they've evolved as a large wild carnivore to be an ambush predator for wild ungulates like deer and deer-related species. So black leopards in Asia really will target the barking deer, which is the muntjac deer, same thing. And we've introduced muntjac here, so no different really. The whole business of adaptation, to what extent they've adapted, is a very important and interesting talking point, of course, because they're they're here. They're not in India or Malaysia or Africa. They are leopards and pumas in Britain. Yes, I suppose because we're an island, they've got no way off. It's not as if, like, in France they could walk off to Germany or Spain or whatever. Um, Yeah, they're in our country. They're here to stay. But it's not like they breed rapidly like um, herbivores. They are an apex predator with limited numbers and limited litters. Yeah. And can you just quickly tell us what's it like to be diving and be close to seahorses? 
Okay. What I would say is it's not just seahorses, it's every living thing under the sea. Yeah. In its vast variety and wonder. People say to me, do you dive off the coast of the UK? Oh, it must be horrible. <laughs> it is wonderful. Yeah. If you dive off, uh, let's say, out to sea from Poole or Swanage or from Portland and find some nice reefs and things to look at, during the mating season, wrasse, which is a type of fish, the males are blue. Mm. And it's like blue fish around the UK. I mean, yes, they are. And prolific. I've always said it is an honor for me to be under the water in the tank rather than on the glass outside looking in. And how aware is something like a seahorse of your presence if you're close to it? Unless you disturb them, they take no notice, but they are delicate. You don't crowd. You never crowd anything. Mm. But if you're maybe four, five feet away and still and just literally relax your whole body so your whole body is relaxed, they won't bother about you at all. They'll just go about their business. Because you've got no threatening vibes, even underwater, that they're detecting. Absolutely. Same goes for mammals on land, I think. It is very much the vibes that you're giving off that they will respond to or not. Oh, definitely, definitely. I've had pods of dolphins turn up. I've had rays come and, and, and literally buzz me, which is stunning to see. Yes, because if you blend in, basically. Yeah, I am renowned as a diver for being totally chilled. When I hit the water, I totally change and, and just relax every muscle in my body. Another reason is you use a lot less air if you do that, so... It must be amazing to do free diving, you know, hear about the free divers who do that sort of thing to extreme. That frightens me. <laughs> I like tanks of air on our back so, <laughs> so I know I can breathe. <laughs> Have you ever seen a big predator, uh, the equivalent of a big cat, <laughs> underwater? Um, I've seen a few sharks. Okay, that's what I was getting at, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, what you've got to remember is only 10% of sharks in the world are dangerous uh, to humans. Yeah. And I used to go regularly in April, May to Fuerteventura because the angel sharks come in for mating. That's in the Canaries, is it? In the Canaries, yeah. During the day, they bury themselves in about an inch of sand. They flick the sand all over their bodies. And that's how they get the nickname angel sharks because they look like angels in the sand. Ah. And they sleep during the day. They're nocturnal. Two-thirds of um, marine life is nocturnal. We were night diving, as you do. One of my friends and his partner or friend were diving. She was watching, because we have torches to see where you're going and look at the marine life. And she turned to her side to see the nose of an angel shark about 12 inches from her nose. And apparently, my friend said the first I knew that she'd seen this was that the grip on his arm from her hand stopped the blood circulation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you do. I mean, I've swum with fish my size. I'm six foot. Wow. You know they can't hurt you, but you're just cautious. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for that off-topic briefing on Another World and your experiences underwater. That's lovely to hear about. Back to big cats, land mammals in Britain. Uh, any final thoughts? Anything you else you want to add? I would just say this. My first sighting in Wiltshire was one of those things, because I think everybody was so blasé about it, I never really took it any further. Hmm. Now, having seen this and positively seeing, and not just me, but my wife as well, I've suddenly become very interested. And this is why I've become very keen, I think, on the conservation of these, that we must look after them. And that's why, like you have said, you know, it's better that we keep this slightly anonymous so that we don't get people coming and saying, well, whereabouts is the cat then? Good or bad because there must be both two sides to every argument. So I think, yes, it's taught me an awful lot and, and has made me very much more acutely aware of rarer things around us. OK. Yes, so it's um, not just the cat itself, but the wider environment, the wider yeah. array of nature. Yes, I have always, because obviously I walk over the fields, mostly with my dog, and we walk a long way, sometimes up to five miles, just for the pleasure of it. And you start noticing things. You start noticing even tracks mm. in, in muddy puddles. You start noticing the animals and things around you. 
domesticated ones, as in obviously farms have sheep and, and et cetera. But also you start noticing, oh, what sort of deer is that over there? Is it a road? Is it a fellow deer? Is it a road? So instead of just saying, well, I don't know, I went and looked it up. I know now when I see roe deer what they look like. I know what fallow deer look like. One of the blessings we do have, we have mating pair of red kites in the woods right next to our house. Oh, lovely. And so we hear the, the juveniles, we hear them crying, we hear them, we see them all the time. They're lovely. They're absolutely gorgeous. Very restful to watch, aren't they? Oh, peace. Yeah, absolutely. You can just, that's the trouble. They're very distracting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good, good problem to have, isn't it? Yeah. Closest to uh, vultures, aren't they, in Britain? Uh, you know, they're scavengers in the ecosystem. They are. They rarely take, they don't like to take live animals. Mm. Unfortunately, we even see them on the road near us. That They do get killed occasionally because they take roadkill. I've had one swoop down in front of the car and take a dead pheasant out of the road right in front of me. Um, and unfortunately, we do see them killed every now and again where they, they're perhaps timing is a little out. Yes. But we see them mostly over the farmland, circling and, and watching. And, and they take, yeah, as you say, the, mostly the scraps and the, the scavengers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, good luck with the cameras, Tim, and thank you for monitoring them. It's so good to have a local custodian and the link with the estate. And very good of the state to play ball with us. It's so good. I will keep you informed. It's absolutely my pleasure. If you feel we need, you know, one more somewhere else that's going to be productive, then fine. But I think we've got two great locations. We have, yeah. The only other place I might think of is over at the farm buildings that are deserted. Yeah, it might be. If we, if we get desperate, we might might try it. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, thank you very much for coming on. I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed all of that and hearing about your diving underwater experience as well. Very grateful for you coming on Big Cat Conversations, Tim. Thank you. Uh, my absolute pleasure, Rick. It's lovely to talk to you. Before Word of the Week, just a quick follow-up on Tim's point about human scent on cameras and human scent deterring wildlife. One person who gives this much thought that we've heard of before in the podcast is James in Shropshire. We heard from him in episode 18 within the pub conversation. James puts a lot of emphasis on removing human and artificial smell from new trail cameras because he tracks in a remote rural area where any wildcats won't be used to human scent. So James dips and immerses his new cameras in a bag of pine needles before putting them out. Perhaps if you don't do something like that, it will take longer for a camera to weather in in a new situation and become accepted by the passing wildlife. On to our words of the week, which are green bridges, the concept of wildlife crossings across major roads. This relates to something we mentioned with Tim, our guest just now, in relation to bridge crossing points on major roads and trunk roads. We discussed that they are important pinch points for wildlife and so they make good positions for trail cameras. There's a photo of the farm bridge where Tim and I put the camera on the website so you can get a flavour of that under episode 38 on the references and links page. So green bridges are about creating wildlife connections across major roads to allow mammals a safe crossing point. I experienced a great example of a green bridge in the Netherlands a few years ago I was admiring some highland cattle grazing on a nature reserve when the afternoon heat got too much for them. They sped past me on the bridge making for a scrape, a waterhole they used on the other side. So I backed away quickly out of their way across the bridge and watched them plunge into their own private lake to cool off. That was a really neat example of the animals making use of a green bridge created for that connectivity that they need across human barriers like major roads. And in relation to big cats, green bridges is a major factor and a major need across many parts of California where small subpopulations of pumas, mountain lions, struggle to connect to each other because of major highways and other similar barriers. This endangers the pumas when they individually try to cross a highway and it restricts the genetic diversity of the populations. 
On our website, under episode 28, we've put a link to a very useful recent documentary which explains this issue and illustrates the Green Bridge crossing points they hope to fund and create in Southern California soon. And we've put a National Geographic article on green bridges with examples on the website under episode 38. Now, still referring to the concept of pinch points for trail cameras in strategic places, Back in episode 28, Paul Ramsden and I said we would put a camera up at a hole in a hedge, right by where we recorded Andrew, the witness, who was followed by a black panther by the River Severn. I did put a camera up there, Paul checked it, and then on his next check it was missing, presumed stolen, which is always a risk, of course, in using these cameras. When Paul reviewed the photos on the camera card after its first check, There is a suspicious image of a black animal which might just be Andrew's cat, and indeed Andrew thinks it is, but it's only the back end, the hindquarters and the tail. Maybe a wide-angle camera might have snapped it in full, and many makes of the new generation trail cameras are wide-angle ones. We've put the photo I'm referring to under episode 28 on the references and links page of our website, and there are some scale comparisons with it so you can judge for yourself. Meanwhile, Paul Ramsden is on the case, trying to network with local people near there to find another good spot for cameras. OK, in our second half coming up now, please don't be put off by the weak audio quality for the first minute or so. It does improve and is hopefully clear enough. So here goes. For our next guest, we welcome Maria from the Tetbury area of Mid-South Gloucestershire. We're about to hear of a couple of encounters that happened in July 2020. Some of you may have read about the first encounter in the press. We're going to hear about that one and hear what happened as a follow-up. So, welcome Maria. Thanks for coming on the show. Hello, Rick. In fact, you're the second Maria within three episodes The previous Maria encountered a lynx in Woodland in Cornwall. And in that episode also, the other guest who saw a lynx-like cat, I think that was probably within five miles of your area near Tetbury in the southern part of Gloucestershire. He saw two cats. Uh, He doesn't think they were the same. And the second one was a puma-like cat. And we're going to hear that yours was a puma-like cat. So maybe it was the same animal. Anyway, take us through it, Maria. Take us through the first time. And you were dog walking with your other half and the dogs, were you? Yeah, that's right. We were walking up the path near Tetbury, it was. All of a sudden, my husband, who was in front of me, he stopped suddenly. I was like, oh, what's that? He was pointed across the field down this bank. And I looked over and I was like, oh, my God, that's a big cat. I was really shocked and stunned. We were like, well, nobody's going to believe that we've seen this. We were just stood like totally gobsmacked watching it. It was just so quick. And then it went. We were walking along afterwards. And like, did we really see that? Or did we imagine it? Then we were like, well, I saw it and you saw it. So it must have been real. It was surprising that the dogs didn't make a noise because normally lurchers, if they see something, They want to go and get it, but they didn't. They were dead silent. It was like they definitely didn't want to spot it. (laughs) They definitely sensed it, did they? I think they probably did because they didn't make a noise like lurchers normally do. Lurchers normally make quite a noise or they want to go and hunt. They were like they didn't want to know. It was just so clear. It was a lovely, bright, sunny morning. It was about half past ten in the morning. You couldn't mistake it for anything else because it was just so clear and so bright that day. It was really muscly, really strong looking cat and it was quite big. I would say it was larger than a Labrador and it had a long, thick tail. Yeah. The shoulders were quite prominent as well. It was like a sort of a a light, like sandy browny colour. All of that's adding up to a mountain lion type cat, isn't it? You identified it there and then, did you, as likely mountain lion, cougar, puma? I grew up watching lots and lots of wildlife programmes, so I knew what it was as soon as I saw it. I thought, oh my God, this isn't normal for this country, really. 
it definitely looked like an, an American mountain lion, otherwise known as a cougar. You guys noticed that it had a rabbit in its mouth, is that right? Yeah, but the rabbit looked tiny compared to the cat. Gives you an idea that it was a large cat. We were so shocked. A lot of people say, oh, well, why didn't you take a picture? If you're not expecting it, you wouldn't have a camera ready for it. Was your instant reaction to check the dogs rather than take a photo as well? I imagine that occurred to you, that the dogs were more of an issue than taking a photo. (laughs) We didn't really think about it. We were just like, well, did we really see that? It was like a feeling of shock and excitement at the same time, if that makes sense. Say you'd virtually instantly thought, oh, I must document this and take photos on my mobile phone camera. Would you have had time? No, because by the time we'd have set the camera up and got it aimed in the right direction, it would have been gone because it was so quick. It was just gone. How long was the sighting for, do you think? Probably about a minute, if that even sauntering along like not a care in the world not far from where we were there's actually a couple of houses further up the bank if they were looking out the window i'm sure they would have seen it as well begs the question if they have seen it and that's where you're going to be able to film it from this is actually what i said to my husband is uh, i wonder if they've ever seen it they would be overlooking it easily Corinne, in um, episode two, had that situation. She was a long way across the valley, but she'd seen one several times. So she was able to have a camera ready and filmed it eventually, even though it was such a long way away, difficult to film it with a steady hand. But that's when people do have the chance to film them, I think. So was it aware of you, do you think? Was it noticing you or not? I don't think so. We were above the bank, so... If any wind was blowing across, it would have gone above it. We were looking down on it, so I don't think it would have got our scent at all. It was just casually strolling along like it didn't have a care in the world. A little bit further up, there's a few bushes where it could have hidden up, and not far from there, there's a wooded area. It does look like the sort of place where anything could have gone up there and hidden in there if it wanted to. Had you heard of any gossip of reports there precisely or in the general area before? No, not heard of anything. I keep sort of like listening out to see if anybody's seen anything there. Nobody says anything. It's always like roughly around the area, but not that area. There's reports within five, ten miles of you. I'd always been sceptical of it because I always thought, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. But then after that, I've seen it. <laughs> It's like, because I always thought, well, never see like a really good, clear picture. I've seen it myself and then thinking about it, I thought, well, I can understand why now. Say that was your land, you owned that land, and you got a clear picture of it yourself. I bet you wouldn't release it to the press. I bet you would keep it up your sleeve, wouldn't you? I probably would, actually, because I don't think I'd want a lot of people tramping around my land trying to find it. I'd much rather it was just left alone to be a wild animal because if there's lots of people trying to get it or trying to hunt it or trying to find pictures of it all over the place, it wouldn't really be like a wild animal. I don't think it would be very fair to it. If you've heard the podcast episodes before, a lot of people think like that. It's remarkably consistent from the people who come on the show in the main. But incidentally, I mean, I have been briefed within the last couple of weeks of doing this. We're now in um, mid-November, aren't we? Just coming to mid-November. And yeah, within the last three weeks, there's been very detailed report to me of uh, footage taken of a puma in another part of the country, not Gloucestershire. I can't say where, not allowed to say where, but they've got too much to lose from releasing it. So it's back to what we've just said. If you had it on your land and you owned that land, you probably wouldn't be very motivated to tell the world about it. No, I mean, the other thing is a lot of people are so sceptical of it that they probably wouldn't believe you anyway. We didn't really believe anybody when they said about it before we saw it. So it's like, why would anybody believe us? What do people think that you saw? Presumably people, friends and family don't think you're lying. They think you're just misciting a dog carrying a rabbit in its mouth, do they, or something? A few people think that we're probably completely off our rocker and just imagined everything. 
some people talk to you as if to say they don't actually believe you, but just go on, say what you want. I think they are quite sceptical of it, really. Does it help yourself and your husband that you both saw it and you can sort of validate each other's sighting? Yeah, it does. Because, I mean, if I'd seen it myself, I'd be doubting myself. But because I know somebody else saw it as well, it's like, well, um, it, it must be real because it wasn't just me. So the press report also said that and I think this is intriguing and probably what a lot of us uh, can identify with, is that your husband didn't get his tasks done for the week during that week because he was too preoccupied with thinking about it and following it up and wanting to see it again. And eventually he set a camera or two up, didn't he? Yes, he did. I'm dragging me out in the evenings with him to try to set up. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I've been very nervous about going back. I worry that What's going to happen if I see it face to face? I get very nervous about it, to be honest, because it's quite a big cat. I think the only chance you'd have of bumping into it really close would be if it was eating something and didn't want to be disturbed and it would sort of hiss you away and threaten you away if you got up close without realising it. Or if it was stuck in a in an old derelict caravan or an old barn or an old building that you happened to wander into if it was laying up and dozing or whatever. Otherwise, I don't think you're going to just bump into it on a footpath. It's going to hear you coming and be away. So I think the chances are remote of you having a close encounter, although you and the dogs were out walking two or three weeks later and heard it. Is that right? My husband, he was setting up a camera to see if he could see it. And I was waiting with the dogs and it was getting dark and I was thinking, God, I don't really want to be standing here very much. So I was starting to get a bit nervous. And then I looked at the path and I could see something moving in the corner of my eye. And I thought, oh, what's that? And it kept looking like it was going up and then down. It looked like it was getting closer and closer. And I kept saying to my husband, something's up there. I don't know what it is. And I kept asking him to come out and see what it was. And it was just gradually getting closer and closer, but it was like slowly getting closer. And I could see it like going up and then down, but I couldn't make out exactly what it was because it was actually getting dark. But it wasn't until my husband stepped out and said, oh, what is it? I was like, I don't know. There's something up that path and it looks like it's getting closer. I can see it. And he said, oh, it's probably deer. And just as he stepped up onto the path, it looked like it pounced up. It did look like, well, basically like a cat leaping. And I could see what looked like something long at the back, which could have been a tail. But what makes me think that it was the cat was the way the dogs were. Because, again, they didn't react like like a normal lurcher. If it had been a deer or something, they would have screamed and played at merry hell to get to it. But they didn't. They were backing away into my legs and went completely silent. It was as if they wanted to get away from it rather than try and hunt it. And that's unusual for them. Yeah, and that's what sent the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. I thought, this is not a deer. This is not something they want to hunt. This is something else. And that's why I got very scared when I saw it. It just looked like it kept going up and down. One minute it was getting closer and it looked like it was up and then it would get down and then it would get closer again almost like waving what I could see it was almost like it was stalking what whatever it was but it was way too big to be a fox and I don't think it would have been a dog either the way it moved wasn't like a dog you could just see like the outline of it like a silhouette that's all I could say you didn't have a torch a spotlight to shine at it no, I didn't. The only thing that husband had was his phone light. He went to see it, and I just saw the back end with this long bit. But I thought, gosh, that could have been a tail. But what made me think that it was the big cat again was the way the dogs were. A lurcher wants, if it was a deer, they want to attack, they want to chase it, but they didn't. They want it to go the other way. Had you ever experienced that behaviour from your dogs before? No. If there's anything they want to hunt, 
they will make a lot of noise about it and they want to go. They will pull so hard, they'd nearly pull you over, but they didn't. They were pushing against my leg as if to say, let us get away from this, whatever it is, sort of thing. Having had the sighting and that encounter, how do you feel about the local countryside and walking your dogs there now? I'm constantly on the lookout and... Well, I was a little bit nervous about it, but now that I realise that they're more likely to run away from me rather than attack me or anything, I feel a little bit more at ease about it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because before I was like, I don't really want to be here. I'm a bit worried about if I do actually meet it. But then you'd like to see it again in a way, is that right? Oh, yeah. I'd love to, if I could actually see, get a picture of it or a little bit of film, you know, some sort of footage or... It's like something to say, this is exactly what we saw. This was real. Then I would be really pleased. Yeah. And it would be nice to have the picture anyway, because they're such beautiful animals, really, that it would be lovely to have that picture as well. Yeah. Your husband set up, um, how many trail cameras has he set up? He has two. Hopefully the two of you are finding that interesting to do anyway. Yeah. It's almost addictive, really, because it's like we really want to find something on there to prove to doubters that there is actually something out there. Yeah. Like I always say to them, well, how often do you have a camera ready for something you're not expecting? Yeah, sure, sure. And, well, say that you had the camera ready and you got a picture. Do you think it would have been very clear? I know you said it was a clear, bright morning and your view was clear, but at that distance, do you think the camera, a phone camera, would have got much of a shot of it? In my case, probably not, actually. I think I would have been, like, shaking so much because I was so excited and nervous at the same time. It would have just been a, a shaky, blurred image, I think. It wasn't close enough to you guys to make you really sort of terrified, scared. You were on edge, presumably, but you weren't full on scared. Is that right? It was more like an excited sort of unexpected sort of feeling rather than fear, really. Yeah. And it sounds like um, it was a textbook, Mountain Lion Cougar. Is there anything particularly that stood out? If you had to say the real distinguishing features of it, what would you pick out? The prominent shoulders, the muscles, and the sheer look of strength in the body. That was what I think stood out more than anything. And the long tail, it was like a very long, wide tail. It was sort of half out and half down sort of thing. And it had a slight lift at the end. Did you see any other coloration? Well, can you go through the coloration that you saw? Like a sandy brownie colour it was, very soft, light sandy brownie colour, almost like a goldeny sort of colour it was. And with the sun shining on it as well, it looks more like a goldeny sandy colour. Did you see the underside or the inside of the legs or the tip of the tail, any other colours? No, it, it was just too quick for me to make any distinguishing features like that, really. Yeah. Had the dogs been up closer, would you have been scared about how they'd reacted or how it might have reacted to them? I've got one lurcher who anything, if it's a deer, a fox, even a squirrel, she will scream, like properly scream as if you've beaten her. But on this occasion, she backed up to my leg and she was so scared. She went really silent as well it was like don't let it see me don't let it hear me yeah that was really unusual for her yeah okay how does it make you feel about other sightings you know suggesting there are other cats in the country and maybe even you know small um, breeding population why is it that you don't hear more about it why is it only recently that people have said more about it that's what i wonder about well, that might be your awareness of it, to be honest. It's been ongoing for decades. You look at some of the, the old material and look at old files and uh, newspaper cuttings. I know this year's probably been a little bit busier than usual because of lockdown and the press haven't had so many celebrities to write about. So the, the cats have taken some of that space in the papers, I think. But I don't think it's that much different from usual, to be honest. 
It might just be that I haven't really took much notice because I was sceptical. But now that I know it's there, I've noticed more because I've been looking it up and think, who else has noticed this and what other sites have there been? You wanted other local people to know, did you? You went to the press because you felt it might be just useful to inform people if they wanted to believe you. I did notice that a few of the comments online underneath what said were a little bit rude and suggesting that we'd made it up or we'd gone a little bit crackers or something. But I just thought, well, I stand by what I saw and they can say what they want because I know what I saw. And I think a lot of people are open minded and each new report maybe opens their mind a little bit more thinking, gosh, there's so many. They're so consistent. Say we have a small population of these mountain lions across Britain. What's your view on that? You know, do you think it's good, bad, or depends how they behave? What's your view? As long as nobody's getting hurt and they're just left alone to get on with what they do naturally, then there should be no problem. It's when people start trying to hunt them and that's not right. They should just be left alone to be natural. That's what I think. Yeah. After all, you're finding it difficult to catch up with it, aren't you, to photograph? And it won't be around very often in your precise local area, perhaps. I heard before that they can have quite a range where they go around and everything. So it could be anywhere, miles away, or it could be actually up a tree watching us for all we know. It's just one of those things. Two trail cameras is, you know, needle in a haystack, but at least you know... It's been there once, you know, may go again, especially if it knows there's a good supply of rabbits. There's a lot of rabbits around, just not far from where the cameras are. There's a lot of rabbits around. So, I mean, there's every possibility it could go back to hunt there because it knows there's plenty of rabbits there. I've heard that um, rail tracks are a good place to try as well. I've heard said somewhere online. That's incredibly coincidental because you've queued up the next episode. The next episode we're going to hear from a guy who was a railway line inspector and that's done at night, but when trains are not running. He's going to talk about a case in the Peak District a few years ago, about five years ago in Derbyshire, and he was followed and we'll hear his um, perspective on that. But we'll also hear what you find when you are a railway line inspector, you know, uh, dead animals along the route and that sort of thing, what kind of debris you get. So I guess they're following a, a route from A to B, a clearing through the landscape, which is easier for them. And, you know, there may be fairly fresh meat to scavenge on the way as well. Yeah, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that before, but yeah. Well, here, next episode, yeah, that's going to be Billy from Derbyshire. You were on a disused railway line. That's presumably quite a linear route. But it's busy with dog walkers now, is it, perhaps? Oh, yes. There's lots of people walk their dogs along there. And I often wonder, do any of these people see anything? Have they seen anything or would they say anything? Yeah, some people might just keep it quiet. But also, presumably, in the dead of night, that linear route is something which animals use and are not disturbed. So a big cat could use it and be not disturbed even though it's very busy in the day? When we've been along there in the evening, we very rarely see anybody along there. As soon as it starts to get dark, there's hardly anybody about. But when it's lovely and sunny, it's really busy. Yeah, yeah. But it could be a nighttime route for for an animal like a cat. Well, great. Well, it's all been very helpful, um, uh, Maria. Is there anything else you want to say that we haven't covered before we close? Thank you for letting me tell you what I saw and everything and... It helps me think that somebody actually believes me. So thank you for that. Part of the role of the podcast, we can all learn from each other. I think it's very important that we learn as much as we can from the the witnesses. And very good that you had such a detailed encounter. And it's rare for people to see them with prey, you know, in their mouth. We did have a lady in Leicestershire who saw one eating what she thinks is probably either a rabbit or a fox. That was a black panther, black leopard type one, but that was lying down in the grass ahead of them as they walked. But it's very rare, strangely enough, for people to actually see them in the act of carrying prey. (laughs) Makes me feel quite honoured that I saw something that's rare. Rare in two ways, yeah. Great. Well, Maria, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show and good luck to you both with the trail cameras. Please keep us posted. A lot of us on the case now, and um, I'm sure the listeners are grateful to you. So thanks very much for coming on Big Cat Conversations. 
Thank you very much for having me on your podcast. Thank you. Okay, just as we were preparing this episode for release, we've had another report from the general location of Maria's encounter, perhaps within two miles of it. But this sighting was of a large black cat, perhaps a black leopard from the description. It's a dramatic sighting with the witness seeing the cat in full-on stalking mode, and much more happened. We might be able to include that in an episode soon, so I won't do a spoiler now. Righto, a couple of quick points before we close, and first just to clarify a little bit about the Puma video footage I mentioned there with Maria. I'm not going to say where it is, but it's in a county north of Gloucestershire. It was taken in October in daylight, and it's a clear video of a Puma on private land, and it does illustrate again that people often won't be interested in revealing perfect information like this, because they may feel they've got far more to lose than to gain. A while ago we mentioned the prospect of an episode hearing about big cat encounters in Ireland, perhaps on both sides of the border. Well, we're now actively seeking guests for a show on Ireland for the new year, and good luck to the new Facebook group there, and that one's called Big Cat Reports of Ireland. If you want more big cat listening, there's a new episode of Missing Panther, the Aussie Big Cats podcast, just out. That one is episode 6 and it features the goings-on in the southern state of Victoria, which has a rich history of panther and puma activity, as we've heard before on these podcasts. So go listen to Missing Panther. For the next episode here on Big Cat Conversations, as we just heard with Maria, we're reliving a nighttime trek along a remote railway line in Derbyshire's Peak District, and there's much to consider in that issue raised by that case, with our guest Billy. Okay, thanks again for this show's guests, Tim and Maria. Time to sign off now, but look forward to being back with you next time. Please take care, everyone. Stay positive and bye for now.